Thank you, Joy. Good evening. It's good to be here. Let's open up our blue hymnals to number 212. <clears throat> number 212, nothing but the blood. If you could please stand, number 212. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You may be seated. We're going to sing one more hymn, remain seated, and then Adam will come and Bring what the Lord has put on your heart. We're going to turn to page number 185. Same book, number 185. Glorious things of thee are spoken. things of thee are spoken, Zion city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode, on the rock of ages found. What can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou mayest smile at all thy foe. See the streams of living waters springing from each 
eternal love will supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove who can faint while such a river ever flows their thirst to swage grace which like the Lord the giver never fails from age to Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear for a glory and a covering, showing that the Lord is near. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion City of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode. Good evening. The Lord's put um, a message on my heart where we're going to be reading from three different uh, Bible stories. And um, what, what you all need to do is make your way to each of these three stories. We're going to go through all of them and uh, put a marker, if you can, on each one because we're going to be reading a lot of Scripture. And let's go ahead and get on right into it. Um, the first uh, part, the first Bible story we're going to read is in 1 Samuel chapter 17. So make your way there. After that, we'll go to Genesis chapter 6. And then thirdly, we will be going to Luke chapter 4. So keep those areas in mind, and we'll be making our way there uh, throughout the course of the evening. Um, Before we start, I wanted to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, which states... To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. With each of these three Bible stories we're going to read this evening, um, the Lord has provided a particular uh, time span, uh, 40 days. The first story we're going to be be reading about is the story of David and Goliath. Uh, Goliath was out presenting himself and tempting and defying Uh, the God of Israel for 40 days before David got to him. The second story we're going to read about is in Genesis when uh, Noah is instructed by God, build the ark, and because there's an impending flood coming. And for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, the wrath of God is going to pour on the earth in the form of a storm, a deluge. And the third story we're going to read about is in Luke chapter 4. And that's when the Lord Jesus Christ is tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. I think the Lord gives us those, that particular time span as a token, in a sense, to show us three parallel stories all referring to the same salvation, the same truth of the gospel, all leading to Christ. And I pray that the Lord would be pleased to reveal himself through these stories to us uh, this evening. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to start by reading the first 16 verses, and we have a lot of scripture to get through, so bear with me. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah and Ephesdamim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and pitched by the valley of Elah, And set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. 
He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with the coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, when will be your, we, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of the, that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for, for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the, to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him, Ab 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 Abinadab, and the third, Shemah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But when David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem, and the Philistine drew near every morning and presented himself 40 days. So here's a form of inter introduction. Goliath is, is symbolic. He's, he's a picture of the Antichrist. He's a picture of self-righteousness, as we'll see in this story, what he says to the God of Israel. He's a picture of man's idea of what power is, and power being, being able to influence other people. Um, he is a picture of works. He's a facade. He's a picture of uh, something in the eyes of men that looks appealing. And 40 days Goliath presented himself in tempting Israel. And on that very note, um, leading up to this point in time, um, the, the Israelites and Philistines um, are frequently recognized to always be in conflict with each other. And right before, shortly before this erupt, eruption in the, uh, of this battle, uh, th that's when Saul tried to present his own sacrifice before the Lord. He didn't wait on his priest, Samuel, but instead he presented his own sacrifice. And what did the Lord do? He departed from him. The Lord departed from Saul because stop, Saul tried to stand on his own before God with his own sacrifice, with his own hands. Unacceptable. And yes, we can point to Saul, but I also want us to look right to ourselves in, in our own sinful nature and in, in our own hearts right now. Because when the Lord departs from you or I, that peace is removed, and it happens. When, when the Lord r removes his hand from us and his presence from us, the feeling of peace is not there anymore. And what happens is we do have our own Goliath erupt, presenting himself, defying the word of God in our own hearts. So we have that own Goliath that is warring against our new man, Israel. So this is a picture of the old man and the new as well. So yes, it's a historical event, but what we should take from this message is, is the symbolism of Goliath being a picture of us warring with our new man, Israel, and we'll soon get to the point uh, where Christ is, is the victor in this battle, and the battle is of the Lord. So let's go ahead and go to Genesis and chapter 6. And start in verse 5. We're going to read verses 5 through 7. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Go down to verse 11. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was, cor it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way 
upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God hates sin. God hates ungodliness. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Move to Genesis chapter 7, verse 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So we have the 40 days of Goliath. We have the 40 days of the, uh, of the pending storm. Let's go to Luke now, chapter 4. And you'll see very quickly why it's important we keep our places back there because we're going to be going back to the Old Testament. We'll read verses 1 through 2. And, and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. All right, so that's the introductory backdrop that we have for those three stories, okay? So let's get into the meat. All right. And we're going to be going back to 1 Samuel, and then we'll be going to Genesis and back to Luke. And that's kind of how we're going to sequence things this evening. All right. So in the second part, when we're getting to the meat of this message, I want you all to think on what God's design is. He's considered the great mathematician. We'll see in how he instructs the, the very specific uh, details of how the ark must be con- must be instructed. He designed and purposed salvation through his own son, Jesus Christ, which is himself. He is God. And he did so to make a way of salvation for sinners, not a way that is open-ended and, and we follow it. But his design is clear, and when when God wills something to be done, it's done. And I'm going to read it. Uh, Isaiah 14, verses 24 through 27. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? When the Lord, all the Lord has to do is to have a thought, and it's done. He thought it. He thought all of this into existence. We're living in his thoughts, in his will, his providence. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, the Lord states, And when he had removed him, Now we're transitioning back into the first story, David and Goliath. When he had removed Saul, when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Right there, shall fulfill all my will. David here is obviously a picture. Is a, he's a type of Christ. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in this, in this story of David and Goliath. And David was anointed by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16 to be the Savior, to be the king, to replace Saul. He was anointed. And so if we go back to our story in 1 Samuel 17, verses 20 through 37, We continue on. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. 
And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For he is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those a few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said, said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and, a, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Looking back at verse 26, I love the bounty, the bounty of the Lord in killing this Philistine, the self-righteousness, the one who thinks by his appearance, by his works, he's going to be saved. Jesus Christ had a bounty, and this is what it was in verse 25. The king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. The king's daughter being the bride of Christ, the church. Uh, and this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And making his father's house free in Israel, meaning liberty equals freedom. Uh, that's freedom from the law, freedom from works, from the worldly way, from the power as received by man, from, from our own sin. Freedom from that. So in that sense, let's go to Galatians chapter 5. talk about liberty right here liberty found in Jesus Christ Galatians 5 verses 1 through 6 stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage behold I Paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised Christ shall profit you nothing for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So we have liberty because Jesus Christ has won this battle. He sets us free. From our sins. And I love in verse 29 when he says, is, this, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause for him to be here? Yes, there's a cause. 
The Lord causes everything. He, by all things, uh, all things consist in him, right? He, he, he's not only the first cause of everything, but he controls absolutely everything in his goodwill and providence. Right here and now, he controls everything. He, he controls every uh, electrical impulse going through your heart right now, every molecule in the air, every thought, every imagination. And he knows us through and through. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Is there not a cause? Yes, there's a cause. Because he predestinated, he foreordained to people to be saved. That's what the cause is. I love how he said in verse 32, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. All right, let's go to Genesis. Let's go back to the flood. We'll start chapter 6, verse 13. No, excuse me, verse 8. Let's start in verse 8, and then we'll bounce to 13. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt... Pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou set it in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein it is the breath of, breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing and of all flesh, two of every sort shall Thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after this kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take unto thee, take the, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all God commanded, so did he. Now, Noah did not design this ark. God did. Noah didn't design a plan of being delivered from this impending doom. God delivered it for him. God created the plan for him, delivered it. And I love how God uses the term pitch in verse 14 there of chapter 6. Pitch is derived from the Hebrew word kafar, which means to cover, to atone, to purge. So the ark was kafard entirely, within and without, so that God's wrath against sin, God's wrath couldn't harm those inside of the ark. In verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. The word shall, shalt, that means it's going to happen no matter what. Shout. When the Lord says shout, it, it's not may. They didn't use the word may, which is discretionary. The word may is, it gives you the option. He uses shout. Thou shalt come into the ark. And I love that he makes that call irresistible. It's an irresistible call. Just like he said, Zacchaeus, make haste. Luke 19. I, I, love, I, I love how the Lord is is walking right outside of Jericho, I believe. He says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he and guess what? Zacchaeus, he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Well, aren't you glad that the Lord makes himself a guest of uh, of sinners? I want to identify myself with the Zacchaeuses of the world. Zacchaeus was a publican. And we know the story about the Pharisee and the publican. The, the Pharisee looking down at the publican, but the publican's beating on his chest saying, Lord, I'm a sinner, save me. 
The Lord saves sinners. Luke 18, 10, 14. That's the story of, of, of the Pharisees and the publicans. And I, I would, I, I'm going to identify myself as a publican. I pray you do the same. 1 Timothy 1 through uh, chapter 1, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I know today I'm preaching to a bunch of chief sinners. I'm a chief sinner. All you all are chief sinners too. And sinners, I love how we, a, a true sinner, confessing your sin. What does that mean? What does it mean to confess your sin? It means to agree with God's assessment of who we are. And so I love how 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9 says this right here. Quote, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sinners shall come into the ark. They're not trying to survive God's wrath by their own abilities. They're not trying to build their own whatever. They're not trying to see how long they can hold their breath. That wouldn't work out too well for them in, in the Lord's tempest. So it's a tempestuous storm. We're going to get in, in the references of the Bible. Uh, the Bible references this type of, of storm that, that led up to the flood. It's called a tempest. The Bible references it in 22 different times, and we're going to uh, look into a couple of them here in a second. I love there in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, where it does say, right there in verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if, if we say, Lord, I'm confessing my sins before you. I don't know half of them. I'm unworthy. I'm not presenting anything before me before before your throne in terms of anything that I've done in my life and instead of looking solely to Christ entirely for my life, death, and, and, and only hope of salvation being in, in, in what he accomplished. If that's our confession, then it, it says he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse, which means we're justified. And to be justified means you haven't ever sinned. Doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean... Uh, as if you haven't ever sinned. Being justified doesn't mean, well, you sin, but in the Lord's eyes, I know you sin, but but I'm, I'm still going to impute Christ's blood on you. Christ's blood is so powerful, as a token of our salvation, Christ's blood is so powerful that to be justified in him means you never sinned. What a mystery. What a mystery. Do I understand that? No, because I'm, I'm a sinner. All I see before me is my sin. Look in the mirror, and you look long enough, and you're going to see through and through the depths of, our, of your sin. And pray the Lord reveal that to you if, if you haven't already. But, the Lord, but, but isn't that amazing? Isn't that such a, just amazing grace, right? That's amazing grace, that the Lord would design his salvation in the way he did. And why? Because he gets all the glory. And I'm thankful for that. All right, Genesis 7, we'll go to Genesis chapter 7, verse, let's jump to verse 18. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. Earlier I men mentioned the word tempest. Again, it's referenced in the Bible 22 different times, and it's all the tempestuous storm, the flood, is all a picture of God's wrath against sin. In Isaiah verse, or chapter 28, verse 2, the Lord states, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Now, Christ faced the tempest of the Bible. He faced the flood. He faced the storm. Isaiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 2 read, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as, a, as in hiding place from the wind 
and a covert from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And we look to the sign of Jonah. We can look to the sign of Jonah as well. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. And lastly, Matthew 20, uh, chapter 8, verse 24. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he, Jesus Christ, was asleep. Verse 26. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, And there was a great calm. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. The face of God's wrath. Luke chapter 4 again, please. Verses 2 through 12. As Goliath is taunting, as... God's all-consuming wrath against sin is coming. Verse 2. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up unto an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Which, just to stop there very very briefly, I just find that so ironic, that the devil would ask God, or would, would say to God, I can give you power. That just shows how strong that delusion is. I mean... You want to talk about power, again, Goliath being a picture of power. He's taunting them. And, and, and I'm not sure if Satan intended to taunt Jesus Christ in the same way as Goliath did, David. But what I do know is, is I mean, God the Father, Satan's powerless. He's powerless before God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, you can go to the garden, look at Satan's subtlety in Genesis ch- chapter 3, if you wish. But you'll see that subtlety. He's, in the same way that, Je- that Jesus Christ was tempted in the wilderness, he, it's, it's very formulaic. It's very formulaic. Satan does the same thing. To all of us. And it's subtle. It's very, very subtle. And it's very easy for us to see the difference in in religion versus under a gospel church. It's very easy for us to see that. Um, But yeah, it's a very subtle, subtle, same exact message that you hear elsewhere. Outside of the gospel church, you hear the same thing over and over and over again. It's the same thing. Eat the apple. It'll get you'll have free will. You'll have free will. Take of the take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, the Lord didn't say you didn't you couldn't eat from that one. A lie. It's based on a lie. And the, the notion that you have free will to choose your salvation. And 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 Jesus Christ was tempted with the same thing. Interestingly. And Jesus answered in verse eight again and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, in all three of these stories, there's going to be a great victory in each one of them. And we're going to read about it right now. 1 Samuel chapter 17 again. Victory and salvation. What Christ did in defeating Goliath, our war, where we don't have to war anymore. We're going to read about that. We're going to read in the flood. He protected his people from God's wrath. He protected 
with the pitch, with the atoning pitch. He purged us of our sins with this, and, and, and God can't, with, with how big that ark was, from the outside, you can't see what's inside of it. All you do is you see Christ. And that's what I want to be identified with. I want to be identified with Christ. When the Lord, in, in his all-consuming wrath against sin, the floods of, of sin, I want him to look at the ark. I want him to look at Christ. And I want to be in that ark. And then lastly, in the wilderness, we'll shortly see that Satan departed from him and he went on, spirit renewed, and he went on and preached the first message after the wilderness, reading from Isaiah. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. This is David, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. The word disdain in verse 42. The Philistine looked about and saw David. He disdained him. The word disdained means the feeling that someone or something is unworthy to be respected. You're unworthy. The religion of this world and our old man thinks the same thing. Our old man, we have, you know, we have a tendency because, because our old man and our, our, new, our, our Israel, we are constantly warring with our old man until that day. When our flesh is no more and we're in glory, we won't ever have to worry about that again. But while we're here, in, in time, there's that war. There's that same war. And that disdain is, is in us as well. Lord, save us from that. I think that's our response. That's the response of believers is, Lord, save us from ourselves. Save, save us. Lord, have David come into my heart and slay my Goliath. Because it's... Our, my Goliath is, again, the chief of sinners. I'm the chief of sinners. Verse 43, and again, this, is, this really shows self-righteousness at its best in Goliath. Verse 43, am I a dog? He asks, am I a dog? Now, quite the opposite. That, that's quite the opposite statement of, of the woman of Canaan, right? Who, after the Lord told her directly, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. She said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. You hear how Goliath says, Am I a dog? How self-righteous is that, right? He's, he's, a, he's a competitor. He, he's competing against other people. And, and we do the same thing, unfortunately. I do. I'm, I'm the first one to admit it. I, I do. And the Lord saves sinners. He saves the dead dogs like the woman of Canaan. Luke 15, verse 7, the Lord states, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And I love how Jesus Christ, is. sometimes he speaks sarcastically. In that sense, he's speaking sarcastically. I mean, first off, the 90, 99 just persons, just persons, I mean, no one's just, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's making a point here to say, and, and, and I love how he says, likewise, joy shall be in heaven. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented. I'm a dog. I'm a dog. I'm unable. Lord, would you give me the crumbs from your table? Verse 45 but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. In verse 46, it's back to our text. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. 
and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And that's a point I was trying to make earlier. The battle, this is the Lord's battle. With our sin, with our self-righteousness, don't try to conquer it on your own. Look, it's the Lord's battle. And he will give you into our hands. And verse 48, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, and that David hasted and ran toward the, enemy, the army to meet the Philistine. He hasted. David went, our David, God's man, God's man, went straight to the cross, didn't he? He went straight to the cross. He went straight to, to conquer all of our sin, all of our self-righteousness. It, it, was, it, it, went, it went on him on the cross. He was imputed our sin on the cross. And he didn't hesitate. He purposefully went there. And I love in John chapter 18, verses 6 through 9, states, as soon then as he, this is in Gethsemane, this is in Gethsemane's garden, Jesus Christ says, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he. As soon as he said, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If that, therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that they that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Jesus Christ purposefully went to the cross. There was no, no one took him against his will. There was none of that. He directly went, I mean, he went with that sling straight at Goliath. He went to the cross. That ark was perfect, right? That ark was perfect, perfectly built. And, and he went straight into God's wrath. And, and, and you know what that ark well, that ark found land eventually, didn't it? And Jesus Christ in the wilderness here in a moment, we'll see. Satan, Satan himself had nothing on the Lord. He couldn't, he couldn't win in any way, shape, or form. The battle is the Lord's. 1 Samuel chapter 17 again, verse 49, continuing. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face of the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Let's go back to the flood. Genesis we're going to go to chapter 7, verse 23. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Go to chapter 8, verse 1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Verse 11. And the dove came into him in the evening and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. Verse 15 through 21. <laughs> And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of the cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings unto the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite 
any more everything living as, ha- as I have done. Thanks to Christ's atonement, that kafar, in and out of the ark. Thanks to Christ's atonement, God is satisfied. God is satisfied with Christ, his perfect life, perfectly obedient to God's holy law. He lifted up, he glorified his father in every thought and in every action he ever, ever had. Even in, the, even in the most difficult times on the cross, he atoned for his people and he, he was successful. And that's where I want to be found in Christ, in Christ's ark, to cover me with himself, that I may be found in him with my sin atoned. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through, the, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Quite the opposite of our Goliath, we must have a new man. We must be, the Lord must rename us Israel. We must be made anew. And we're only made anew through Jesus Christ. And lastly, in the Luke chapter 4, verses 13 through 19, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he had departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. We are accepted in the beloved, in Jesus Christ. And these three stories, shown as parallels, showing Jesus Christ saved by design, by purpose. He he won the battle. We no longer have to fight. Stop pumping your arms, trying to swim in God's flood. Thou shalt enter into the ark. And lastly, oh, the Lord conquered Satan. He conquered Satan in the wilderness itself, and he came out, and he went straight to the the word, and, and fame came out from him. I pray that we would worship the Lord and live in his providence. As John Chapman recently preached, living in his providence. In every day in the Lord's providence, every moment that we would would not look too far ahead, but, but just enjoy the moment that we have here with the Lord Jesus Christ and hearing about his gospel. I pray that Greg would have safe traveling mercies back. Um, we're very thankful for our pastor here. Uh, prayerful for um, the two men bringing the messages, Robert and Caleb, this Sunday. Pray that the Lord would bring messages on their heart hearts and uh Pray for uh, that the Lord would be pleased to uh, to just raise Himself up uh, through His Word to save sinners. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. God Almighty, Lord, I'm insufficient. My words are insufficient to raise You up in Your glorious truth. Pray, Lord, that You would be pleased to to call Your people to command us, Lord to come down from our trees, from, to come into your ark, Lord, to know that the battle is yours, that you've won. Please remove our Goliath, Lord. Please cause us to rest in everything that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished, that being 
in his perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, which is pleasing to you, Lord. That you'd be pleased to resurrect him. Please find us in him. Please find us in him in his death and in his resurrection, that we may be sons and daughters and, and heirs with him, Lord, if you're pleased. Pray, and we know that, Lord, we are sinners, chief of sinners, and we ask for your grace continuously, Lord, that you'd always find us. And, in, in, in Lord, when, when, we do, when we do backslide, Lord, that, that you'd be pleased to bring us back to you at all times and not in the end, Lord, when it matters most. Thankful for your word, thankful for your scripture, thankful for your people. In your name we pray, amen. We're going to sing number 40 in the soft back. If you all could please stand. <clears throat> number 40. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is 